through the sessions tomorrow. So, let's see. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I feel like it's uh, second rate, I mean second, what do you call it, second, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm <laughs> thinking about this. Uh, it, no, I don't have to do that actually. I think I can plug it in right there. And it, this thing ha goes is input and as you know, it's input and an output both uh, in the same socket. Oh, now we're talking! Yay! See, I had 45 percent left, and I was afraid tomorrow was going to be a mess. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Could I borrow it and give it back to you tomorrow? Are you around tomorrow? Yeah, we're. My kids are coming. I may not be able to make it. Back. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, if I give it back to. Uh, yeah. We got a power cord, hooray. Hello? Test, test. Are you ready to test? Braden said to turn it. It's not in the test, 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 test. Hello. All right, we're about to get started in about a minute or so. If you need a cup of coffee or one more thing to grab before you find a seat, uh, we'll have a little break between the first session and second session, and that'll allow us to partake partake of the wine. All right. Well, thank you for thank you for coming tonight. I'm almost heard. There we go. It was about three minutes in, so he'll be here to the student. But you know, come on in and, and come back and hear some more because everything he says will be interesting. And you'll after tonight, you'll you'll be back. I guarantee it. Uh, let me give a little uh, introduction uh, first. To, well, let's uh, stop and pray first. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us, your kindness, your mercy, for making us your people and being our God for uh, your forgiveness through your son 
And we ask now that you would bless our time this evening together as we uh, look at the things that you have created in um, this world and that we see your goodness and truth and beauty through it. We ask that you would, uh, Tennessee, he's a conductor and composer, associate professor of the arts and cultural apologetics at Crichton College, where he taught art and music history, philosophy of the Christian faith, directed theater, and founded and directed the Institute for the Arts and Cultural Apologetics. He lectures on Aeschylus, Augustine, Aquinas, and the arts. And he says he's hoping to soon get to the bees. <laughs> it's a great privilege to have him with us tonight, so please help me welcome Mr. John Hodges. Thank you very much. I hear the uh, audio is working. Are you getting signal for your sound? Thing? Okay, very good. Thank you. I just didn't know whether I turned the buttons on right or not. Well, my job tonight is to give an, a reason for why we ought to study the arts. That's my, that's my goal. So I'm going to do several things. I want to talk to you about uh, why it is that the arts are worthwhile, and particularly the liberal arts, but then specifically the performing arts and the literary arts, uh, <clears throat> and then talk to you about the secret of the universe, and then I want to talk to you about, <laughs> well, it is, it's, really <laughs> it's sort of understated, isn't it, the thing, secret, <laughs> secret, secret of the universe, and it was second in the list. <laughs> you think they would be first, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, but uh, I want to talk about that, what's, what's going on there, and, and I want to tell you a little bit about um, uh, some examples of music and literature and, uh, and even visual art as we go, okay? So that's, that's kind of what, it, what I'm about. Now, if this is, this won't hurt anything, I'll put my foot on the chair here. I, I haven't tuned this, so... It's an old uh, ancient Chinese song called Tu Ning. <laughs> Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. Wait a minute, that's not how it goes. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Yet in, yet in thy dark street shineth the ever. That's not how. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. What a beautiful song, right? Why is it that it was written the right way and not the way I botched it up? On purpose, of course. Why is that? Why would that be better? in any meaningful way. Don't you agree that it's better? Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting. No. It's not as good, is it? Why? There's a reason. There's a reason. What's the poetry? O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see above thy deep and dreamless sleep in this quietness the silent stars go by, just like they do every night. And then it has this word, yet, yet, yet. What does yet mean? But, hang on a second. Something's different. Yet, in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. That's something, right? This is this little town, no place. It's really a no place ville. And yet, in your street, not without the incarnation there ain't, but that's what it's singing about, isn't it? So why is the music better to do this? Yet in thy dark streets shineth 
what a wonderful chord. It's a whole new thing. There are no G. Get in my dark streets, shine if there's that G sharp. The everlasting light. We're in a different, what is that? E major, an E major triad in the middle of C major. Why is that so different? Because the light is new. The light is different. It's something nobody's ever seen before, you see. Now, this is a simple song. This is not earth-shaking. You know, we talked about Bach last time I was here, right? It's not, it's not the B minor mass, but it's thoughtful. It, has, it makes sense. The music actually is better to change that way than it is to play it the same. To have the, the first two lines be in C, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. And then a very similar line, above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Kind of, the, kind of an, uh, uh, an inversion of that first melody, but it's still straightforward C major, boring old C major. But yet in thy dark street shineth Oh, something magical has happened, you see? And the music reflects it. And I want to argue that makes it actually, in a meaningful way, better music. Most people would say, what's better? How can music be better? You either like it or you don't. Music is a matter of personal preference, right? I like reggae and you like jazz and, you know, it's all a matter of whatever you like. But I want to argue that in God's economy, that's not the way it works. There is such a thing as harmony. There is such a thing as, as um, craft, where pieces that are disparate, elements that are disparate, things that are different, actually fit together in harmony, in harmony. So what I want to talk to you about first, I'm going to come back to that idea of harmony in a minute. Um, I want to come, we'll, we'll tell you about um, why it is that the liberal arts themselves are important. And then I want to talk about specifically one of the liberal arts, one of the seven. Who knows wh what the seven liberal arts are? Does anybody know? Some of you guys that go to, go to school here should know. <laughs> anybody want to volunteer? Can you name any of them? What's the, there, there are three, right, and there are four. There, there's, there's the trivium and there's the quadrivium, right? Okay, so what's the trivium? Well done. <laughs> Grammar, logic, and rhetoric, that's right. And the quadrivium? Arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Interesting, huh? Music, why music, I wonder? Well, let's talk about why those seven. Those seven were the, 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 the sort of backbone of the medieval university. That was the, those were the tools by which you learned to handle something very important. And that, hand, that, that thing to be handled was God's revelation. God reveals himself in two different ways, doesn't he? He reveals himself in what they call special revelation, and he reveals himself in what you call general revelation. Revelation, right? Is that common knowledge? Okay. Well, special revelation is the scripture itself, right? And the person of Christ. But they're both, they both have something in common. Do you know what they are, what it is? They're both called the word. Did you ever hear about know that, know that? They're both called the word. Not only is the Bible the word of God, but Jesus himself is the word of God. Hard to get that in your head, but that's how it is. So, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, the trivium, has to do with language. And since God has revealed himself in language, we need the tools to be able to unpack that language and make sense of it, you see? So, we learn about grammar, all the parts of speech and the proper spellings of things and the all that, all the, the, the sentence construction of, of subject and verb and all the things we learn in grammar. All those very important things. Because you have to know those if you're going to try and unpack a sentence, right? Make sense, of, uh, make sense of language. 
And logic is really just taking those sentences and putting them in, into what they call syllogisms, that is moving them into relationships with each other that help you dis discern the truth. Because particular kinds of sentences, called statements, can be organized into two premises and a conclusion that lead you to know something for sure. You can actually know things for sure by way of logic. We used to use as an example, um, uh, all dogs are brown, Bob owns a dog. So the conclusion would, ha would could be, if those two are true, the conclusion would be what? Bob's dog is brown. Now, how can you know that? Well, if the, pr provided the first two are true, right? Of course, not all dogs are brown. But say they were. If they were all brown and Bob owns a dog, I don't need to see his dog to know that it's brown. Do you see? It's, it's, that's what logic does for you. It actually allows you to know things by necessity. Now, in this case, of course, since not all dogs are brown, I can't be sure that, do that uh, Bob's dog is brown. And uh, so it works in the reverse, too, actually. It can help me out a lot. If somebody says all dogs are brown and Bob owns a dog, therefore do his, his dog is brown. I can say, hang on a second. The first statement is not necessarily true. And if it's not necessarily true, I can't be assured that his dog is brown. It may be some other color. Anyway, you get the idea. That's what logic is about. There's, it's much more complicated than that, but that's the basics of it. And then rhetoric. Rhetoric is taking the arguments that you've learned and finding ways to be persuasive about them, finding ways to communicate those things in language with all of the help that, uh, that uh, language can give you to be, persuasive, to, to be able to persuade people uh, to agree with you. Now, the, the point is not to just to agree with you, but to agree with the truth, to see the truth, and then to be, in a sense, uh, persuaded by the truth, to, to, to take it up as true. God speaks at various times in the scriptures about our reasoning with him, and I think he includes this kind of talk, you see. So uh, uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric have to do with, um, with language and understanding special revelation. That's why they studied it. There were tools that make it possible for you to unpack language. I'm going to come back to rhetoric in a minute. But then, what about the quadrivium? Arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Well, they all have something in common, too. Can you guess what it is? Math, exactly. Numbers. And you see, we know that God has revealed himself in the created order, too, don't we? He's, he's revealed himself in, his, in the order of the world. Um, the heavens are telling the glory of God, we're told in the Psalms. Uh, Paul talks in Romans 1 about how, uh, how the world itself actually reflects the maker so much that we're without excuse. We can't possibly say we didn't know there was a God. The world resonates with his creativity. And if you just study it a little bit, you begin to see just how amazing the world really is that he's made. So if we want to be able to make sense of his glory through general revelation, the way to do that mainly is through numbers. Arithmetic is the functions of numbers. Um, geometry is the study of shapes. Astronomy is the study of distances, great distances. And then music. Now why would music be in there? Why not some other? Do you know? Very good, yes. That's part of it. You're exactly right. He says because of beats and music. You know about beats and music, right? Yeah, there's a pulse to it, isn't there? Very good. But there's another reason, too, and that is harmony. Because harmony is actually the ratio of numbers to each other. Did you know that? What we think of as harmony is really unit fractions. That's basically what it is. So I thought maybe I'd show you on the guitar here just a little example. If you were to take any string and divide it exactly in half, it will sound exactly an octave higher than the original string. If that's your original note, if you divide it in half, I'm not going to actually fret the string. You know how guitars work, right? They have these little metal frets. And you push down between the frets, and it bends the string over that fret and makes the string shorter. And if a, if a string gets shorter at the same tension, does it go up in pitch or down? 
up, right. So, the shorter this string gets, the higher the pitch, right? Okay, but I'm not gonna actually fret the string, I'm just gonna touch it, just gonna touch it, right at the exact midpoint of the string. Listen to what you hear. Can you hear that? It's exactly an octave higher than the string. Now, if you divide that half of a string in half, that is, I'm giving you now the one fourth of the entire string, it should go up another octave, and it does. Can you hear it? Now, if I divide that in half and I give you just an eighth of the string, that too should give me another octave, but it's really hard to hear. Listen carefully. Oops. There it is. Can you hear that? La. So one, one half, one fourth, one eighth. Whoops, there it is. You hear it? Well, that's just how God made strings to vibrate. That's how they all do. That's how we can have a piano. That's how we can have a violin. That's how we can have a guitar or a bass. Anything that has strings, they all vibrate the same way. Now, wind instruments are the same way, too. There's a column of air in a wind instrument. And if you, if you divide that column of air in half, it, it sounds an octave higher than it, than it is. But what about the unit fractions that are not one, uh, the duplicates, doubles, one half, one fourth, one eighth? What about in between, like one third of the string? What does that give us? Well, let me show you. This is what one third, here's the open string, right? So here's what one third of the string sounds like. Can you hear it? It's very loud. La, there it is. La, <clears throat> right in the break for me. There's, the, there's one octave, that's one half. There's one third, there's one fourth. Now what about one fifth? Can you hear that pitch? Isn't that interesting? Now the funny thing is, when I play this string open, it's great that it's so close to the microphone, you probably can hear it really well. If you listen carefully, especially as it gets softer, you will hear all those overtones ringing. Because when I pluck the string like that, it actually plays all of those overtones at the same time. It plays the, fun the fundamental, the, the whole string, very loudly, but then it plays the, the overtones too. So listen for this, for example. Can you hear that? Listen for that. I'm not gonna fret it now, I'm not gonna touch it. I'm just gonna play the open string, and as it disappears, listen if you can hear that note. It's very soft, but it's there. Yeah, can you hear it? You listen for this. It's hard to hear. Uh, it's tough to hear, I'm afraid, sorry. But it's in there. It's just that, it's very soft, that sound. And then this one, see, the, hear that? Now listen for that. It's there too. It's very soft, but trust me, it's there. Now the reason that this is important is because in every string, you actually get more than one pitch. So you're not just playing one note. The one note is the, the fundamental, is the loudest note. If you know your physics, you know if you see a wave, the, the amplitude of the wave gives you the volume of that wave. And so the, the fundamental frequency is the one that has the widest vo uh, uh, amplitude, like that. Yeah, but if, you, but if you listen carefully to the other ones, you can see the other ones in there, but they're smaller, they're not as tall. And yeah, because they're, they're con condensed together, the frequency is higher and they're condensed together, but their amplitude is not as big either. And because of that, you can't hear them as well. All die away the main one to die away until you can listen to the, to the softer ones. So um, this doesn't work as well some, as, I, as I'd hoped, but you have to trust me, it's really there. But here's the cool thing. If you play, let's say I play what they call an E major triad, an E major chord on the guitar, like that. 
it sounds consonant to your ears. Do you know why? Because all the other, two, the other two pitches, there are three pitches in a triad like this. There's the E, there's the B, and there's the G sharp. All three of those are in there. You hear that? Well, those three notes happen to be in that bass note. It's that, the B, and the E, the G sharp. Where is it? There it is. There. There you go. Now, if I were to, if you think that it just has every pitch in there, you'd be mistaken. I can show you if I don't do a unit fraction, not exactly one half or one third of the string, but in between, I don't get anything. Isn't that interesting? It's not. Well, I'm getting something because I'm touching it at exactly one seventh of the string. It's about three sevenths down. But if I, if I don't go right on the frequency, on the uh, exact place, you get that. There, that's a good one. There's nothing there, see? It doesn't ring. But it does ring on these pitches. All those notes. But it turns out those are the notes that are in my E triad. That note is just this note. Can you hear it? And this note is just this note, an octave lower. Hear it? So what I'm saying is, the, what we have done as human beings is we have understood the, freak, the, the physics of strings and, and the way God made things to vibrate in harmony. And then we've built a musical system on top of that for our pianos and our guitars and so on, you see? But we're starting not with nothing. We're not making it up out of scratch. We're starting with what God has actually made in the world. That's how things vibrate. They all vibrate that way. This table vibrates that way. If I could just isolate the frequencies in it, it wouldn't sound like noise. You'd hear pitches. Everything that you tap and make vibrate vibrates in that way. Isn't that amazing? So that's the idea. You have it built into, uh, into the way of the world, the way of physics, in the, of, the, of God's creation, you have something called harmony. Harmony is not the same as unison. Unison is either a, one note with itself or one note with its octave, but not a, not a different pitch, right? So all E's are, in, are a unison. Uh, but if you e add the B and the G sharp in there, then you have a, a, a chord that's harmony. But the B and the G sharp are not the same thing as an E. They're different pitches, different frequencies altogether. However, they are frequencies that fit together mathematically. And so, what the, what the uh, medievals understood, and you, you can, they learned it from going all the way back to Pythagoras, pre-Socratic philosopher Pythagoras, was that the world vibrates this way and harmony works this way. And it gets established in the ancient world as a way for us to understand the, the way God made the world. The, the, we're, we use the ratios we find in music to understand other things that are in harmony. Plato talked about it, and you can read about it in the, in the Republic and in the Symposium both, where he says, uh, what we need to do is teach young people the beauty of harmony by teaching them music at a young age, at an age that's where they're, before they are uh, able to reason, when they're just little ones. And the idea is, he said, to teach them beautiful harmony then when, when their hearts can get attached to it innocently and they will learn to love harmony for the rest of their lives. Not just harmony in music, but harmony in other ways. I'll show you how. But what he said was, when they come to the point that they are reasoning, you know, whatever, 10, 12 years old, something or other, start thinking in, in sort of logical reasoning terms, they find that they long for harmony, and so they exercise their reason to find it. Isn't that an interesting idea? And he says, when they grow older, they will not only love the harmony of music, but they'll love harmony in other ways. You'll find harmony metaphorically in other things. So the harmony of a good business relationship, for, for example. I'll give you 10 of these if you give me one of those. And both sides say, yes, that's a fair and right and just you know, uh, exchange. That's good. 
Uh, and so they both go away happy. They say, yes, that was, that was a harmonious thing. But it wasn't unison. It wasn't one of these for one of those, do you see? It was the 10 of these are worth one of those. You know, 10 dimes for a dollar or something. So they say, yes, that swap would be a fair swap. And they're looking for harmony. They're looking for the two things to fit together. And then ultimately, he says, uh, there's the harmony of a good marriage. Marriages are between two people that are quite different, right? I used to say, I know that God has a sense of humor because he invented marriage. <laughs> he takes two people who are as different as they can possibly be and makes them fall in love with each other and then promise that they'll never leave each other for the rest of their lives. They're going to suffer, you know, whatever comes. They have no idea what they're getting themselves into. None at all. But that's, and God chuckles, I'm sure. But he knows how good it is. He knows how good it is for there to be harmony, you see? Not unison. In fact, just to not put, to put too hard a line in it, I think this is the real reason why it's a bad idea to have homosexual marriage, you see? Because it's, it's meant to be harmonious. It's not meant to be unison. It's meant to be disparate things coming together in some way that complement each other. They all have relationship with each other. They bring strengths to the, to the marriage uh, that the other doesn't have, you see. And that's what harmony is. It's bringing things that are not the same into right relationship with each other. Ultimately, Plato would say that the, the uh, ultimate harmony is, um, is justice. He says, the, the, you, want a, you want your city, he talks about this in the Republic, you want your city to be a place of justice. Uh, you want the, um, the actions of the, of the citizens and the reactions of the state to be in harmony with each other. So if I do something really uh, noble and heroic, um, they, maybe the state would give me a medal or have a parade for me or something, you see. But if I did something ignoble, something not good, broke the law, or I did something terrible to somebody, the state ought to also, in harmony, give me the proper penalty for that, you see, so that I go to jail or I may be executed or whatever it is that I'm deserving of, the proper, uh, just, just, I'm not talking about, you know, executions for jaywalking. I'm talking about, you know, some proper relationship between my action and the state's reaction. That's justice, just justice. That's what people would call justice. And, and Plato would argue justice is harmony. And harmony is, in, is something that you learn to love when you're a little kid. That's the idea, you see. So harmony is actually a better basis for a society than equality. Let me see if I can explain that. Because equality actually, well, it does exist in two places. But in every other place, it doesn't exist at all. Equality is absolutely impossible between people, except in two ways. One, before God. We're all equal before him. And two, before the law. We should all be, I say should because I don't think we always are, <laughs> should be equal under the law. That's how it's supposed to be. It doesn't make a difference whether you're rich or poor, man or woman. It doesn't matter what country you come from. The law ought to be applied equally to everybody. But beyond those two things, there's no, just look around the room. There's no equality among any two people in here. Not in gifting, not in height, not in hair color, not in, you know what I mean? It's just not possible. So the French, you know, argued that in the French Revolution that, uh, that what we wanted to, that they wanted to have was liberty and e, uh, equality and uh, fraternity. Do you remember those, those are three words that they, that they use? Liberté, égalité, fraternité. It's hard to get the R's in. But that's what they argued for. But if you think about it for a second, there was a sort of built-in impossibility about it. It was a very poor, uh, poorly based revolution, if I may say so. Because you can't have both liberty and equality. It can't happen. You see why? If people are going to be free to do the good, which is what liberty means, then you can't equalize them all because they're not equal. But if you try to equalize the outcomes, everybody gets the same pay or everybody gets the same promotions or everybody gets the same height or whatever, you're going to rob them, some of them, of their liberty. Some of them are going to have to uh, uh, go slower. <laughs> some of them are going to have to do poorer. 
uh, and some of them are going to have to do faster to make everybody equal. It's not possible. So it actually abuses people to make them equal. This is, I'm not trying to get political here, but that's, that's a, it, there's a real problem today. But what I am saying is, this is, remember the point of the lecture is about to talk about why it is we want to learn the arts, why the arts are important to learn. And the reason is because the arts teach us about harmony. Music in particular, but all the other arts too. There's a relationship between words and the ideas that they speak of. And so poetry becomes extremely important. Learning to handle poetry, learning to read it, and to write it even. Literature becomes extremely important. It's in the novel, it's in the, the play, it's in the, the uh, uh, short story that we're able to craft language to be able to get at the invisible things that that art is speaking of. And so there's a kind of harmony between uh, the idea that the artist has, the writer has, and the actual writing that he does. You see? Let me recommend a book if you haven't read it. There's a great book by uh, Dorothy Sayers. Are you all Dorothy Sayers fans? Yeah? Well, Dorothy Sayers, maybe you've read it. It's called The Mind of the Maker. And it's about God as a maker, but it's also about us as makers. We're makers too, you know, because one of the characteristics of human beings is that we are made, uh, as made in the image of God. One of the characteristics that we have is that we're creative. Not creative ex nihilo, mind you but creative. I'll tell you a quick funny story, I, a little parable somebody told me one time that this decided he really worked really hard to figure out how to create life himself. He wanted to be able to make life, you see. So he thinks he's got it. He thinks he's figured it out. So he challenges God to a duel. And he says, God, I think I can do just as well as you. Uh, I'll create life, you create life, and we'll, see, we'll compare them. And God says, okay. Not that threatened, to tell you the truth. Um, and uh, so the, the guy says, great. And he sit, gets down on the ground. And he starts digging into dirt and gathering up dirt. And God says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm getting dirt ready for my experiments. And God says, get your own dirt. <laughs> Creation ex nihilo, right? Out of nothing, that's what he said. So <clears throat> anyway, that's what's going on in the arts. They are bringing about a kind of harmony between the ideas that we have that we want to convey and, the, uh, and the, the person we're communicating it to. Now, we get this idea not from ourselves. Again, we, we don't really create anything, do we? We get the idea from Scripture because God himself wants to reveal himself to us. It's the kindest of things. I mean, how could we ever possibly know anything about this transcendent, invisible, omniscient, omnipotent God if he didn't say, I will reveal myself to you? We could never figure out how to know him. We can try, loads of people have. But how could you possibly imagine the real God, right? But what if he told you about him? Ah, now we're talking. Now how is he going to do it? And this is the imitation that we do. You see, How he does it is how we imitate. So what does he do? He actually speaks to us about himself in the only way that we can understand and that is by way of metaphor because he's invisible, he's intangible. We can't see his face, can we? I mean, apart from the incarnation I'm talking about because the incarnation is the, 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 the absolute metaphor, <laughs> if you think of it. He's, you know, when Jesus comes and says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then there you go, now you're set. You've seen the real thing now. But when he talks about himself in the scriptures, how does he talk about himself? It's always metaphoric. He always says, I'm a king, or I'm a shepherd. Or I'm not even a shepherd, I'm the good shepherd, because <laughs> they're bad shepherds. Right? I am, uh, I'm, I'm your friend. I'm your brother, he even says, we're told, that we're actually going to be related to him. Um, there are loads of different ways, even in inanimate ways, he refers to himself as, as bread or as, as a vine. I'm the vine, you are the branches, right? I'm the way, he says. I'm the path, I'm the way. Or I'm the, um, I'm the door, he says in Revelation. You know, I, 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 
what are these things? Kings and shepherds and doors and bread. And, well, they're all things we see in this world, right? We know kings. We know what kings look like. We know what shepherds look like, what they do. But he's actually saying he's like those things. He's like a vine. He, in fact, he doesn't say like at all. That's what I say. That's why I use the word metaphor. You know, the, the technical definition of a metaphor is comparing two things with each other without using what? Like or as. So he's not like a king. He is a king, you see? But there's an interesting relationship between the two. In fact, let me see if I can read you, let me read you this uh, definition. The difference between a, a, a metaphor and, a, and a, a simile. I think I have it in my notes here. Yeah, here we go. OK. Uh, this is a fellow called Henry Norman Hudson, who wrote a book called Shakespeare, His Life, Art, and Characters, Volume 1. <laughs> but he says this, now a simile, as the name imports, is a comparison of two or more things more or less unlike in themselves for the purpose of illustration. The thing illustrated and the thing that illustrates are, so to speak, laid alongside each other that the less known may be made more intelligible by the light of which, what is known better. Here, the two parts are kept quite distinct, and a sort of line runs between them. And the actions or the qualities of the two things stand apart, each on their own side of the line, those of neither being ascribed to the other. But there is a relationship between them. But a metaphor, on the other hand, uh, in, in a metaphor, on the other hand, the two parts, instead of lying side by side, are drawn together and incorporated into one thing. The idea and the image, the thought and the illustration are not kept distinct, but the idea is, and this is his word, incarnated in the image. So that the image bears the same relation to the idea as the body does to the soul. Let me read that again. So that the image bears the same relation to the idea as the body does to the soul. In other words, the two parts are completely identified, their qualities interfused and interpenetrating, so that they become one. So when Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, he's not saying, I'm like a vine and I, you are like branches. He's saying that they are the same thing. They actually share and cooperate with each other as though they were one thing. Do you see? Well, how else could he describe to us the nature of our relationship with him in John 15? How else could he do it? He could uh, maybe, maybe an infinite number of ways. God, he could do it any way he wants, right? But somehow, this is the way he thought would be best to get it across. And he's saying, there is life in me. There's no life anywhere else. He even says later on in those very verses, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you want life, this is where it is, you see? Just like the branch has to remain in the vine if it wants to continue to live, not shrivel up and die. Well, in the same way, that's how we are with him. We need that, right? So what, what I think he's saying is that there is a relationship in the vine and the branch that is so similar to uh, the way he is with us that there's no difference. It's significantly different. That's what a metaphor can do. It can take you not only to, from the thing that you know to the thing that you don't know, but it can open your eyes to the reverse. Once you know about that vines and branches are like him and us, it not only tells you about the invisible thing that you didn't know before, but then you turn it around and you see that we know more about vines and branches. Actually, we're better vine dressers now because we know how to treat vines and branches, you see? Because we know, spiritually speaking, that's where I need to be. It happens that the vine and the branch need the same kind of treatment, you see? And this is where it really gets cool. Because 
Jesus didn't just look around and say, let's see, is there anything out here that's a little bit like me? Uh, that vine and branch, yeah, that'd be good. No. He actually is the guy who made vines and branches. He's the guy who invented them. He's the word that holds all of that together. Vines and branches, it's not that, that he looks like vines and branches. It's that they look like him. You see, he's the original. They're the imitation. So if you start thinking of the world that way, you begin to see that the world with its doors, and he is the door, and with its bread, and he is the bread, and with his vines and branches, and we're the vi he's the vine, we're the branches, and, and kings, and all these things, that you start realizing this world wouldn't be this way if it weren't for the fact that he was first the way he is. He's the original, it's the imitation. In our day, this is a little side point, but in our day, we are basic, as a culture, we're basically materialists. We think that material things are real and, and invisible things are somehow less than real. They're not, they don't have the weight, uh, the significance. And that's, as my dad used to say, bass awkward. <laughs> He's got it backward. The, the reality is the invisible thing, that is God himself, is so much more real than anything else because everything depends on him for their sustenance, right, for their existence. Everything. And not only to be made to begin with, but sustained moment by moment throughout the, your life. Every molecule in your body is actually being held together by the word. The whole place will one day come apart. <laughs> and he'll say, okay, that's it. That's enough. But he's holding it all together now, you see. I was just telling somebody about this the other day, and I realized that um, our language kind of reflects our assumptions. I'm kind of an amateur etymologist. I like the history of words and how words are used and what it reveals about who we are and all that. And what occurs to me is that in a materialistic culture, and when I say materialist, I don't mean we like to buy a lot of things. I mean, I mean uh, we, our assumption is that the, the highest good, the summum bonum, is uh, the material world, right? That's, that's what really exists. Everything else is a little dicey if it exists at all, doubtful. But the reality is we actually say, we kind of agree with that in our language because what we say is if something isn't important, it doesn't carry any weight, it's not significant, we say that it doesn't matter. Isn't that interesting? In the, in the law courts, if you bring up evidence uh, that doesn't apply, it's immaterial. Isn't that interesting? But that's our language. We just kind of have a built-in assumption that things that are material are real, you see, and the things that are not material, well, they're not so, isn't it kind of cool? Anyway, side, side issue there. But, but what I'm trying to get at is th the two elements I'm talking about are harmony, where two or more things are fit together that don't fit together, that are not the same. They're not unisons. They're not the same. But they do have a relationship with each other. And when you can find that proper relationship, you find something beautiful. Just like if I were to play pitches on the guitar, guitar, play that low E, and then play other pitches that are not in the, the unit uh, fractions of that string, it sounds dissonant to our ears. Isn't that interesting? Let me see if I can show you. Sorry about the intonation. That's consonant to our ears. But what if I played, let's see, this. It's not beautiful, is it? It's not, it, there's something wrong. <laughs> when is he gonna resolve that? <laughs> well, that's how, that's how music works. It understands harmony and consonance and dissonance, and then it can tell a story, actually, by starting at home with consonants, going away from home into dissonance, and then coming back home again to consonants. And we feel like we've gone on a journey, a harmonic journey, as it were. That's what music can do. So harmony is essential, and I want to argue that harmony 
comes from the Trinity. Because what we've got is a God who is in three persons, but only one God, in the same way that that E chord is three different pitches, but only one chord. That's not three chords, it's just one chord, but it's made up of three pitches. And the wonderful thing about it is that you can hear all the pitches, none of them gets in the way of the others. This is an old Jeremy Begbie story. He said that it's really hard for us to understand the Trinity because we are so visually oriented. If you try and think of three different objects and, and you put them together and try and have all of them at the same time, one of them will eclipse the other one. You know, it'll get in the way of the other one. You'll, you won't see all of one of them. But if you listen, not look, but listen, you can hear a chord like that and you, you hear one chord, but in it you can hear every pitch. You can hear that pitch and that pitch and that pitch and that pitch. And they're all there, but they're only one chord. Isn't that interesting? So it's, it's, um, it's a way of understanding a, the kind of, not the Trinity altogether, but sort of the fingerprint of the Trinity, if I can be in Our visual sight is like that, in that everything is in three dimensions, but only one thing at a time. And so everything has height, width, depth, but none of it, but if you take away any one of those three things, you end up not with just the other two, you end up with nothing. You know? Like if you had a, 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 a book, let's think of a book for a minute. Um, it's this tall, and it's this wide, and it's this deep. But let's say I start tearing out pages, and I work it down so that it gets down from 100 pages down to 50 and 20 and 30, oh, 11 and 1. Now it's got only one depth, one page depth, now I get rid of the covers and I have just that one page and then I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to turn that page into zero, okay, I'm zero depth. It still has its width, it still has its height, theoretically, but because it doesn't have that third dimension, neither of the other two are there. You see what I mean? And that's how it is with the Trinity. You can't take any one person of the Trinity out and have the other two persons. You have nothing. You see? It's impossible to understand. I mean, I'm trying to get us to understand the Trinity. Um, I'll leave that to the theologians. <laughs> but, but it does so happen that there's a kind of resonance of the Trinity in the world. You see, he made things to be three and one at the same time. Pretty cool. So there's a kind of harmony of the three elements. There's a kind of harmony of the three pitches. There's a harmony of the disparate elements in a marriage or in justice or in all these other things. So harmony actually is essential for us to understand what God is trying to tell us about himself and about how the world he made is supposed to fit together because that's, that's it. Think about Paul talking about the way the church is supposed to work. We all have different gifts, we're told and we all have different abilities given by the Holy Spirit. And we're supposed to be different. That's a good thing, that's not a bad thing. We're not here to be all ears or all eyes or all whatever, right? So we need the kind of harmonious relationship of disparate things for the church to work. That's how the church is supposed to be. And that's how your body works too. If you only had a liver, there wouldn't be much else, right? <laughs> but but you, if you didn't have a liver at all, there wouldn't be much else either, <laughs> right? So anyway, there's, so harmony is an aspect of it. The other aspect of it is metaphors, what I'm trying to say so far. Let me see how I'm doing for time, good. Um, metaphors, metaphors make it possible for us to know something about the invisible world, you see? Because the invisible world is part of reality. In fact, it's so much part of the reality, it's actually more real if you want to think of it that way. I'm not saying that this reality isn't real. I'm just saying that it's dependent. It requires the other to have its sustenance. And so God himself being independent is in a sense more real than we. we he came first, if you can think of it in time. I don't know how to do that exactly. But that's, that's, uh, that's what's going on. And so if, if, the re if reality is partly material and partly not material, and we want to know about the part that's, that we can't see with our senses, smell, taste, whatever, then we need metaphors to be able to do it. And that's how God speaks to us. That's how he does it. He says, let me tell you about the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God is like this. A sower went to sow some seed. And then he tells about seed and about the ground and the birds and what happens to the seed and how it grows up over here and is choked out by weeds and over here and it has shallow roots and over there it bears fruit. And then he doesn't explain it to you. I think I mentioned this in a previous lecture. He doesn't interpret it for you. He wants you to know what it means. He says, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And in Mark uh, 4, I think it is, uh, it says the, the disciples went to him and said, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Something equally profound. Um, and he said, well, you know, if you don't understand, he kind of chides him a little bit. You know, if you don't understand this, how are you going to understand anything? You've got to be able to see metaphorically. You've got to be able to see beyond the material. You want to see through the material to the truth beyond it, you see? The, it, I'm not taking away from the truth of the material. This is not the matrix we're talking about here. This is, not a, in, this is not a fake world that it's only in our minds. It's real. But it's not the only thing about it that's true. And here's what I think. If you were to take the, the uh, spiritual away from, say, the vine and the branches relationship, take the spiritual dimension of it, the meaning of it away, you'd still have vines and branches, but something would have been lost. Vines and branches, as purely as material things, are, are astonishing, sure, and inexplicable if you don't think that there's a God who made them, I think. But there's something about them that is, that has, there's a kind of majesty or a kind of profundity that is in the vine and branch precisely because it does more than just tell you about vines and branches. It, it is a, a metaphor of something beyond itself, you see. Well, that's what poetry does. Um, um, Edmund Burke, you all Edmund Burke fans? Yeah. yeah. Edmund Burke wrote a terrific book uh, on uh, reflections on the revolution in France. I mentioned the, you know, like it, the revolution in France. And in it, he talks about something called the moral imagination. Have you heard about this? The moral imagination. And he, he opposes the moral imagination as a view of the world with something he calls the idyllic imagination. I-D-Y-L-L-I-C, idyllic. Not idolatry, but idyllic. And there are a lot of differences between the two, but one of the things I want to bring up is the difference between uh, man in, under the moral imagination and man under the idyllic imagination. And what he would say is the idyllic imagination assumes that man is basically good. And that the evil in the world, the evil in the world that we have to admit exists, only exists because there are institutions out there that are wrong, that are, that are evil. Institutions like the government or like the church or like society in general or, um, you know, all sorts of things. Um, laws and, and courts and various things that organize people. Those are oppressive things, he would say. This is, I'm talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Do you know Rousseau? Rousseau is pretty much the father of this idyllic imagination concept. Um, so evil exists, yes, but we, and to stamp it out, we have to actually adjust our, all these external things. We have to adjust our governments and our laws and our society and our norms and, and our uh, um, uh, church mores and so on, uh, laws. The moral imagination, on the other hand, says man is basically flawed. He's, he's sinful from birth, ever since all the way back to Adam. And so the evil that we find in the world, it's true it may be that there is system, systemic evil, as they call it, that is outside of us. It may be. But the real reason it's there is because we're such sinners, and we're the ones that have made those the systems, you see. So it's possible. I'm not trying to say that uh, of the two of them, you can't have... Uh, systemic evil under the moral imagination. I'm only saying that if you were to make it, if, if it were possible, and it's not, to get rid of all of the systematic evils, the institutional evils that anybody can imagine in the world, poverty, um, um, you know, hunger, um, any of the, anything like that, so, things that are bad in the world, things that are hard on people, any kind of suffering. If you could eliminate all of that, you still wouldn't fix the problem because the problem's inside me, it's not outside, you see. 
Solzhenitsyn said, uh, the line between good and evil doesn't fall between nations or between economic classes. The line between good and evil falls between the two halves of the human heart, every human heart. Sadly, that's the state we're in. So the reason I bring it up is the moral imagination argues that the only way that you can actually address the evil that's in the world is to have a spirit supernatural fix. You've got to fix something that you yourself, and I'm talking about me, can't fix myself. I can maybe rewrite laws. I can reset society. I can, who knows, redo. I can become a Marxist and redo economics. I can do all sorts of things, right? But, but none of that is going to fix the real problem. The moral imagination says that the problem is supernatural. But thanks be to God, right? Because somebody has actually saved us from that evil. Praise God. We should be on our knees thanking him every day for that because there ain't no other way out. It's, it's impossible. So what the, what the poet is doing is showing you metaphoric relationships between those two worlds. It's one world, but they have to be harmonized. They have to be worked up. They have to be understood. Maybe we should take a break for 10 minutes or so and uh, come back and I'll, I'll give you some examples, okay? I've got a painting I could show you, maybe a bit of poetry, uh, maybe a bit of music, whatever you like. All right? Okay, thanks everybody. 10 minutes. <laughs> watching last night. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a guy named Schauberg. You ever hear him? He was a
came up with some uh, ideas that even Hitler appropriated him and, and put him in research. That's amazing. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. What do I need to do for this? Is it the is there a power button on here, uh, Jared? Yeah, okay. Is, could that be it? I think I got it. I just didn't want to break something. Well, I've been known to break things. <laughs> let's see. All right. <clears throat> well, I probably buried the lead because what I wanted to tell you was that the secret of the universe is that it looks very much like the Trinity. You see? So the world actually resembles the Trinity and in those ways. And I think uh, any time that we can find harmony in the world, we actually are doing his, his work. When things that we don't, we don't think fit together, look for the ways that they fit together. Then don't give up until you find that they do. Uh, and I think in that way we can glorify God. All right. Well, let me show you a couple of things. Um, this is a painting. Anybody know who painted this? Vermeer. Vermeer. Very good, very good, very good. This is called Lady with a Balance. Can you see what she's doing? She has a... Uh, can, yeah, can we turn those off? Will the, the others go off? Thanks, Jared. So you can see a little better, maybe. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I got rhythm. <laughs> I got music. OK. All right. Well, this is called Lady with a Balance. Now, can you, see, you can see that she's got uh, but it's hard to see, maybe, but you can see she's got a little balance in her hand. I think I've got a close-up of it. Let's see. There you go. Can you see what she's doing? She's, she's looking down at her table there, and on her table are all of her jewels and her money, uh, coins and things. And uh, she's got a balance, and she's putting things in the sides to see about what things are worth. She's weighing the value of her possessions, you see. Well, Vermeer was a very interesting painter. And he painted not just this scene, which is an amazing scene. I mean, just take a look at it for a second. It's just beautifully done. See the light coming in on the left side? So many of his paintings have light coming through from a, an invisible window or a very barely visible window across like that, very dramatic lighting. That's typical of, uh, of the Northern Baroque, too, if you're a Rembrandt fan or uh, even the Southern Baroque, now think about it, Car Caravaggio or some of the other great uh, Bar Baroque painters uh, had these dramatic, this dramatic light from one angle. Uh, so he was doing that. It's very diffused in some ways, but you can see hard shadows on her, the back of her head, you see on the back of her, her dress and so on. Uh, that was uh, the, the light of this world coming through the window uh, at the angle. But, but in addition to the fact that he's painted this very carefully, uh, to show you her riches and how she's contemplating her riches. You need to see the painting on the wall in the back. Take a look at this. Can you see what that is? That is Jesus enthroned in heaven, in the top, 
and he's judging. This is in judgment. And the characters on the left-hand side are being invited into heaven, the sheep, and the ones on the right-hand side are being condemned to hell, the goats. And so at the same time that she is valuing her things, he's doing the real evaluation in the back, do you see? So Vermeer was actually speaking to us about keeping our eyes on the most important things, you see? And the beauty of it is, the beauty of it now I'm talking about, because harmony is beautiful, right? So taking these two things, these two similar things, but not the same things, and putting them in their right relation is what he's all about. So the composition of it is important. Look where he puts her. She is right in the center between the sheep and the goat, you see? She is the one that's in the balance, as it were. She's the one that's going to be judged. And we don't know which side she'll go to. But her head is right in between them, do you see? That, was not, that wasn't accidental. That was on purpose. That's the kind of harmony I'm talking about in a painting like this. He's actually crafted the, the composition of the thing to speak to us about the thing that he's talking about. Let me give you a, um, I think I have another few paintings here. Yes. Take a look at this collection. I'll, I've got a series here that I want to show you. This is a painting by a fellow called Piet Mondrian. Have you heard of Mondrian? He's an early 20th century uh, uh, Dutch painter. Probably the most famous Dutch painter since Rembrandt. This is an early Mondrian. Well, if you know anything about the beginning of the 20th century, um, Nietzsche had written his dire atheistic diatribes and has, has, has uh, the ideas that he pro professed, professed have gotten into the bloodstream of the society. This is probably about, oh, I don't know, 1920 or so, maybe a little earlier. Uh, and uh, the, the, the problem, without, without God in your worldview, you can't just continue. You, ha with, you have to have something that holds everything together, some kind of unifying factor in your philosophy. Um, Nietzsche was just bold enough to say, no, you don't, and pressed on without it. As, but he also went insane for some other reasons. But anyway, my point is, Human, most human beings can't actually live that way. So a lot of the artists of the early 20th century, the ones that we call more abstract artists, were painting in such a way as to find a way to get at the unity of things without God. I think if you want to understand early 20th century art, I think this is the key element to, to know. They're trying to make sense of things without actually having a, 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 an all-knowing God perspective on anything. Well, if you know uh, Picasso and, uh, and Brock, both started painting in what they call cubist style. Maybe I could go up a couple of them. Yeah, this is, um, let me show you this. This is a cubist picture. Maybe this one would be better. Can you see, this is from a very, maybe the first cubist painting. It's early, early 1900s, maybe 1905, something like that. I'm pretty close there. Anyway, this is from a thing called Les Damiselles d'Avignon. And these women are painted from more than one perspective at the same time. Can you see that? Like the one on the right there is looking straight at you with two eyes. So she's, her face is pointing this way but her nose is in profile. It's the same, it's the, it's the view of a nose looking at it from this way, you see. So what he was actually trying to do was take a multi-faceted, three-dimensional thing and see all of the, all the dimensions in one flat surface. The idea of cubism is to take the pieces and actually 
bring them all so that you, the audience, get more than one perspective on the thing you're looking at. The only way, I mean, if I'm painting this young man here, I can see him face to face, right? Like that, I paint him facing me. But if you were painting him from this angle, you might see him very differently with the profile and so on. But what this painting tries to do is to get both of our perspectives into the same picture, you see? Well, as it progressed, it became more like this. This is Picasso. All the elements of the face, all at the same time. Even the back of the head, all of them. Well, Mondrian early on was painting like this. But he argued that everything that you actually see in the, out there in the world is a combination of basic elements. Every curved line, for example, is a combination of, in degree, of horizontal and vertical. Every color is a mixture of the three primary colors, right? What are the three primary colors? Anybody know? Red, blue, yellow. Very good, those three. Everything, everything actually comes from those three in various combinations. And every intensity comes from the two ends of the spectrum, altogether white and altogether black. So what if we were to start seeing the world, painting the world, as though it were each individual thing was a, an example of the universal? In other words, every curve would become a straight line. Every color would become one of the primary colors. Every intensity would become either black or white. Push everything to its basic unity. The idea is to be able to have a kind of universal mindset about the things that we're looking at. So as he went through his life, he painted like this to begin with, which seems to be nearly a, you know, a 1880s, 1870s impressionist picture. He started painting churches that looked like this. Look at the uh, leaves on either side of them, the trees on either side of it. Can you see how they're becoming kind of geometrical sh shapes and not just leaves? They're not specific. And the, um, sorry, started to look like this. I don't know why it's going backward like that. And then it started looking like this. And then, oh, I see, I'm touching the little thing there. There you go. This is obviously a tree, but it becomes more abstract like that, and more abstract like that. You see, everything's becoming vertical and horizontal. Every color is being reduced. Eventually, this. And beyond that, that. This, this is this, if, if people jump into the history of art at this picture and they go, what the heck is that? It's because they don't know what's come before. It, this, is, this is actually the next step in this, this it's a, it's an, uh, if I, I, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but it's a kind of a pseudo-religious understanding of the world. It's an attempt to make up for the fact that we no longer believe in God. That's basically it. I, I know it, that seems like a tremendous generalization, but for a moment here, that's what I'm after. But eventually, he goes to this. Do you see how it's just yellow, blue, and red, and white and black, horizontals, verticals? But even that was too much. He, should, he painted this. And you begin to th think, well, what on earth? But that's what it becomes, you see. This is abstraction. This is what abstraction is all about. Now, in the 20th century, there was also what they call uh, expressionism. And I don't have time to go into all that. But it's the other way, where, you, where everything gets reduced to emotional states and, and responses emotionally to things. And uh, you, hear, you see it first in the paintings of maybe um, uh, Van Gogh and Gauguin. But then long, uh, into, into the 20th century, it gets increasingly intense. And you get operas like Wozzeck, if you know Wozzeck. Um, I know you would know Wozzeck. Um, so 
Let me, let me read you a little bit of poetry because it happens in poetry too, not just this idea of abstraction. Now go back to the idea of metaphors. Um, read, um, this is, this is uh, T.S. Eliot. If you know T.S. Eliot, uh, he was a, a really famous uh, modernist uh, poet. In the beginning of the century, he uh, became famous for a poem called uh, The Love Song of J. J. Alfred Prufrock. And then probably his most famous poem that's still taught um, is, um, is called The Wasteland. Um, but both of those were written before he became a Christian. And he converted to Christianity in 1927. And in about 1939, about the time the, the first world, Second World War was about to begin, uh, he started working on something he called the Four Quartets. Anybody ever read the Four Quartets? Yes, good. One? Anybody else? Oh, good. A couple of others. Super. Well, this is one of my favorite bits from the Four Quartets. In fact, I'll read you a bit that it's not up here first uh, because it's so much, it's so obviously Christian. Listen, listen to this first. He says uh, in one of them, uh, um, the wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands, we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art, resolving the enigma of the fever chart. Our only health is the disease. If we obey our dying nurse, whose constant care is not to please, but to remind of our and Adam's curse, and that to be restored, our sickness must grow worse. The bloody flesh our only food, the dripping blood our only drink. In spite of this, we like to think that we are sound, substantial flesh and blood. Again, in spite of this, we call that Friday good. That's Eliot having come to faith and brought all of his command of the English language to bear on the astonishing gift of Jesus, sacrificing himself on our behalf. The wounded surgeon is with a capital S. He's God, he's Jesus himself. The wounded surgeon, the one that has the holes in his hands, is working on us and he the cancer out of us, you see. But it's compassion that does it, not, not evil resolving the enigma of the fever chart. Why are we suffering? Why do we have this illness? Because we're sinners. We have this sin that can't be take, de dealt with and so on. The, the um, uh, what does he say? The, um, our only health is the disease. It's the same thing as Jesus saying, I only came here to heal the sick. I'm not here to help the, the, the healthy. If you don't admit that you need help, I can't help you. Our only health is to admit the disease if we obey the dying nurse, the nurse who's dying on the cross, whose constant care is not to please us. He's not telling us these things to make us feel good. He's telling us these things because we need to be reminded of our and Adam's curse and that to be restored, we have to be willing to take on the, the truth. That to be restored, our sickness must grow worse. And in spite of the fact that there is blood and gore on that Friday, we call it good. How can you say good? How can anybody say good nailing God to a tree? And yet, that's good. But that's what he's talking about, you see. Well, this is the guy who has command over the language. And this, the reason I want to show you this is because I think this gives you an idea of what the artist is really all about. Because in every fifth movement, there are four, the four quartets are four different poems. Each poem has five movements. And the fifth movement of each of the four poems is almost always about uh, writing, about art, about his craft, about his work. So this is what he says. This is amazing to me. So here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, the years of l'entre-deux-guerres, which means between two wars, trying to use words. And every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure. 
because one has only learned to get the better of words for the thing no one, one no longer has, uh, I'm sorry, let me say it right. Because one has only learned to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say, or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. That's how elusive the thing is that we're after. And so each venture, each poetic attempt, is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate with shabby equipment always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of feeling, undisciplined squads of emotion. And what there is to conquer by strength and submission has already been discovered once or twice or several times by men, one who, uh, men whom one cannot hope to emulate. But there is no competition. There is only the fight to recover what has been lost and found and lost again and again, and now under conditions that seem unpropitious. But perhaps neither gain nor loss. For us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. Home is where one starts from. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated of dead and living. Not the intense moment isolated, but with no before and after, but a lifetime burning in every moment, and not the lifetime of one man only, but of old stones that cannot be deciphered. Let me go back to the reading, part, the writing part of it to begin with. Look what he's saying here. Here I am in the middle way. First of all, Eliot is excruci excruciatingly well read. And if you know the wasteland, it's basically a com compilation of clips and, and fragments from all of the great works, East and West, th throughout all history. It's a tremendous bit of poetry. But he's talking about the fragmentation of the world in the, in the wasteland I'm talking about. In the, he's talking about the fragmentation of the world by giving you fragments. It's genius. It's just genius. But here he's got this unifying Christianity now in his heart, because before he wasn't a Christian. But still, references that should remind you of past books and other things. Here I am in the middle way, in the middle way. Does anybody recall hearing that kind of opening before? Yeah, what do you think? Give that girl a star. Well done, that's exactly right, Dante. The very beginning of the inferno, right? He's talking about being in the middle way, middle of his life, in the middle of the woods. Here he is in the middle way, just like Dante. But what he says is, having t had 20 years largely wasted between the two wars, trying to use words. And this is the guy who has the greatest command of language in the 20th century, probably. But for him, look at it. He says, um, he says, each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate with shabby equipment deteriorating. What's the shabby equipment? It's his ability to write. It's the words that don't quite fit the thing he's trying to get at. So he's very frustrated, like every artist really is, trying to get at the thing that he's trying to do. But then there's something that comes in. And look at this. He says, what there is to conquer by strength and submission has already been discovered but once or twice or several times by people who are far better writers than I am. He's got, you know, he hears Shakespeare and Milton in his back, you know, back there. He's listening to Dante and, and uh, John Donne and people like that who really were incredible writers. But then, but then the Christian element comes in. And this, I think, should apply to this school to the work of, of, uh, of crafting a classical Christian school and the kind of education you're trying to give your young people. Look what he says. He says, there is no competition. I'm not in competition with Shakespeare. I'm not in competition with Dante. There's only the fight to recover what has been lost. And every generation, it's been lost and found and lost again and again. You need, to, you need to be working to recover the lost tools of learning, as Doug Wilson used to say, and, and, and uh, 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 Dorothy Sayers said. We need to do that. That's part of the work we're doing. But we, f we want to recover what's been lost again and again, and now under conditions that don't seem very conducive. 
Isn't that the case in our, sta in our uh, uh, United States these days, in the Western world? We're in the minority wanting to do this. But he says, but maybe there's neither gain nor loss. For us, there's only the trying. For us, there's the being faithful and leaving the results to God. For us, the rest is not our business. Do you see that? How do you send a, a missionary off to the Middle East where he has to preach to the Muslim people? Imagine how difficult that would be. Maybe some of you, some of you have done it. I haven't done it. But you don't do it for the numbers. <laughs> you do it because God said go, right? You don't start the school to make money. You don't teach the next generation because you want them to have good jobs. It may be nice that they had nice jobs. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that they learn to glorify God. And that people don't care about much. I'm talking about the, the culture. They're not thinking that way. So we look a little weird to them. But this is the depth of one of the great geniuses of our 20th century writing what I think may be the best poem of the 20th century. And I tell you that as a musician, not as a poet, OK? I'm not an expert in poetry, but of all the poems I've read, this is the one I like the best. And he gives you a picture that you can grab a hold of and walk with that resonates so well with what you know the scripture teaches. But it's given in another set of words. It's given as a, its own creation, but it's speaking of the truth with a capital T. The rest is not our business. Remember that as you do your work. Let me, let me give you a, an ancient poem then, one that I like a lot. It's a poem by Robert Herrick. You know, know Robert Herrick? He's a 16th century mystic. You probably know Robert Herrick. Say again. <gasps> Which one? Oh, how wonderful. So you guys know this piece. Is that right? Are they singing it? Are the boys singing the soprano parts? Spectacular. Have you heard the recording of the Cambridge singers sing it? Have they heard it? Oh, OK, well. How about the rest of you? Have you heard it? No? Well, let me read you the poem, and then I want to play, I'll play it for you anyway, because it's so good. It's so gorgeous. I, I'm not a real, I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings. I'm not a real John Rutter fan. But once in a while, he hits really well, and I think this is one of his best. But the more I read the poem, I think the poem is even better than the music. So listen to the poem. He says this, what sweeter music can there, what, what sweeter music uh, oh, now I've forgotten it. No, 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 don't tell me. I, I, mean, I, I, have it, I have it memorized. Can we bring, of course, I'm sorry. I, my mind went blank for a second. What sweeter music can we bring than a carol? This is a Christmas song. For to sing the birth of this our heavenly king. Awake the, the harp, awake the string. Very much a, a, a reference to the uh, Psalms, right? David and the psaltery and the harp. Awake the harp. Dark and dull night fly hence away and give the honor to this day that sees December turn to May. Maybe I should give it to you while I'm doing it. Then I won't. Hold on a second here. There you go. Sees December turn to May. Why does this chilling winter's morn smile like a field beset with corn? What? It's a very northern, uh, northern uh, uh, hemisphere uh, uh, Christmas. Because <laughs> in Australia, of course, Christmas is in the summertime, so there's no December turning to May kind of you know, springtime. But this is a very English sort of poem. So he says, uh, why does this chilling winter's morn smile like a field beset with corn? Or, or uh, a smell like a meadow newly shorn, thus all of a sudden. Come and see the cause why things thus fragrant be. Why is this happening? Tis he is born. That's why. Whose quickening birth gives life and luster, public mirth to heaven and the under earth. We see him come 
and know him ours, who with his sunshine and his showers brings all the, turns all the patient ground to flowers. That's where they come from. The darling of the world is come. Have you ever thought about Jesus as the darling of the world? And fit it is, we find him room to welcome him. And the greatest part, the, the nobler part of all this house is our heart. That's where we want to invite him. Which we will give him and bequeath this holly and this ivy wreath to do him honor, who is our king and lord of all this reveling. Let me play it for you. Your boys. tenderness
songs. I can't wait for you guys to sing it then this Christmas. That'll be a wonderful thing. It's not easy to sing. <clears throat> All right. Well, I only have a few minutes left, but I do want to give you one more example of how it is that the art is so important that it opens our eyes to things that we might not have seen otherwise. The, um, let me see if I have the right one here, half a mo. Thought I had the right one up. Excuse me, just a second. Some of you said that you've been to Chartres Cathedral and uh, I thought it would be fun to, oh no, I don't know that I have it on here. I thought I had it. Well, I mean, I have to do it without the video, vi visuals. Um, in, in Chartres Cathedral, which is, um, was built in 1145, uh, in uh, Chartres, France, the town of Chartres, Chartres, that's how they say it. Um, uh, the cathedral was built in 1145, and then in the early 1190s, it burned, part of it burned down. And uh, when they rebuilt it, they, they decided to rebuild it. Uh, they rebuilt it, they rebuilt it in the, in the new Gothic style. And so in the same building, you have some bits that are what they call Romanesque and some bits that are Gothic. So you can, it's a great cathedral to study because you can see both of the, the styles in the same building. Well, one of the great accomplishments of the Gothic, uh, uh, Gothic style is the stained glass window. The idea was that a fellow called Abbot Suger wanted to build uh, walls that were thin enough and high enough that they could get sunlight into the building. Because these, these buildings, you see, don't have any uh, steel reinforcing in them. They're just made, built, made out of stone. Uh, and the stone, of course, has to be extremely thick in order to keep a, a, a high ceiling, a high roof from uh, caving in. All the, the roof pushes against the sides of the walls, right? And it would collapse this way if the, if the thing weren't strong enough, wide enough. But the wider the wall is, the less light you get inside. And so a lot of the, no the, the Norman or the Romanesque uh, buildings are uh, very dark. But Suger said, uh, he was an abbot, and he said, I want to design a building where the glory of God made symbolic by the light can come into the building. And so he built the first Gothic cathedral, and it was uh, Saint-Denis in northern uh, Paris, just north of Paris. Well, the style caught on, and by the time uh, uh, Notre Dame de Chartres, the Chartres Cathedral, was being rebuilt, it was rebuilt in this, this style, and so the uh, windows that were put into the Gothic buildings got put into this, this uh, new one. Uh, and one of the marvelous windows is called the uh, Good Samaritan window. And I want to tell you the story of the Good Samaritan window. Um, some of you may have heard this before, I know, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> but I told them at dinner that I would tell this story, so I won't tell it. You read these windows. The, these, the, the window I'm talking about is about, um, oh, I don't know, maybe from, from here to the wall wide. It's, it's very wide, maybe not quite that much, and about 30 feet high. So it's a massively tall, what they call a lancet window. It's a tall, pointed window like this. And <clears throat> you read these windows from left to right, from the bottom up. So you start in the lower left-hand corner of the window, and you read across, and then you read up, like across, like this, like going sort of the opposite of how you'd read a page. <clears throat> And in the window, on the bottom row, you have uh, two, actually, pictures uh, of, um, uh, I think there are, I forget, is it shoemakers or carpenters? One of the, one of the guilds. Anyway, the, the guilds were the ones that gave the money to give, to donate these windows, you see. And so they get sort of to sign their windows by having their work put in the corner of the window. So you see these little shoemakers work. I think there are shoemakers in this particular window. But in the middle, you see a picture of Jesus speaking to uh, several people, and one in particular. And then the next row up, you see a man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he falls among robbers, and he's beaten and stripped, and all his money is taken. And then you go up to the next one, and he's, 
he's uh, 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 on his own. He can't help himself. He's dying, and who should come along but uh, a priest and a Levite, and they both go by on the other side, as you know the story, right? And then uh, a Samaritan comes along and has pity on the man, puts him on his own donkey, binds him up, first of all, and puts him on his own donkey, takes him, all these are across the way, uh, to the uh, inn. Uh, and in the inn, he, the, the, the last frame, uh, you see the man lying in the bed in the inn uh, with the innkeeper there and the, and the Samaritan, and the Samaritan is giving him some money. And then the next frame of the window, that's about halfway up the window, and the next frame in the window is um, uh, the creation of Adam. It just changes gears right in the middle. <laughs> and suddenly you're in the Garden of Eden, and uh, God is making Adam. And then you have Adam in the garden, in this beautiful picture of the garden behind him, and he's alone. And then you have a picture of God, of God making Eve, drawing Eve out of Adam, uh, and then uh, the two of them in the garden. And then you have, um, uh, you have a picture of the, of the tree with the fruit, and uh, Adam and Eve on this side, and God on this side, and God is going like this, you know, so you know what he's telling you, don't eat this. And, uh, and then the next frame, of course, is them eating it. And then the next frame is them sowing fig leaves and God coming. You see him in the upper corner calling to them, and they're sowing fig leaves and looking over their shoulders at him. And, uh, and then he, he uh, chides them. Uh, and then you see um, the, toward the top is a, uh, a shot of um, Adam and Eve in discouraged looks going out of the garden and at the gate of the garden is an angel with wings and a great flaming sword and he's, he's dispatched them, he's sent them out of the garden and they are on the left hand side in the garden all the plants are beautiful and green and flowery and on the right side they're brown and dying and like that so there's the curse of the world they're working into. And then you see uh, Cain killing Abel and then you finally see Jesus at the very top of the window in judgment over the whole thing. He's, he's seated, like in that uh, Vermeer, he's seated at the top with angels on the other side, and he's clearly judging. And that's the, that's the window. And the question I had was, when I first saw this many years ago, why those two stories in the same window? What do they have to do with each other directly? Have you ever heard of that, thought about that before? Those two stories? I've told this story many times, and I've never heard anybody that hadn't heard me talk about it know why those two stories go together. It turns out that not just at Chartres Cathedral, but at several of the other main cathedrals in the north, northern Paris there, north, north of uh, France, I mean, uh, the same two stories were in the same window. So it was common to put those two together in people's minds in the Middle Ages. Strange, huh? Well, this is how it was explained to me. And I since looked into it, uh, and the early church fathers agreed. This is the way they understood it. Um, and I even read, well, I'll tell you about Calvin in a minute. Um, the, way it's, the way it's explained is this. Every detail of the story is essential. None of the details are accidental or of, of no importance. So. When you have a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho, he's not going from Jericho to Jerusalem or from Bethlehem to someplace else, right? It's specifically from Jerusalem to Jericho. And if you know the topography of, of Israel, Jerusalem is on a hill and Jericho is in the plains to the east. So a man who's going from Jerusalem to Jericho specifically has turned his back on the city of God and he's going away from it, you see? And in going away from it, he's also going downhill. So he's in decline. And so the interpretation is that the man going from Jerusalem to Jericho is the sinner. He's me. And because he's turned his back on the city of God, because he's going to decline here, he he's actually falls in among robbers who rob him of everything that is of any value. His, his, his money, his clothing, strips him naked, strips him of his dignity, strips him of his humanity, basically, strips him of his life. Because now he's in a position where he can't help himself, you see? And that's the state of affairs for the, for the sinner. Well, who should come along but a priest? Now, it wasn't just anybody, 
It wasn't a car mechanic or a, you know, somebody. It was, it was a priest. Well, what would the priest represent? Well, the priest represented the sacrificial system, the Old Testament sacrifices. He's the one who would do those for you, right? The high priest every year would do those. So the reason that he went by on the other side is not because he's a bad priest and he didn't care about the guy. That may be true too, but that's not why. The interpretation was he went by on the other side because the sacrificial system that he represented can't help you. It can't solve the problem, only temporarily. But then who else should come by but a Levite? Again, not a butcher or a baker or a candlestick maker, but a Levite, specifically. Well, what does the Levite represent? He represents the law. The book of Leviticus is the book of the law, right? So the Levite comes by, and he goes by on the other side, not because he just doesn't care about people who are in need, but because he can't help the guy. The law can't save you. It can point out your need for saving, but it can't actually do the job. So who should come along but a Samaritan? Now, who's a Samaritan? A Samaritan is the one that the Jews hated. They saw the Samaritan as a, a second-rate kind of half-breed, right? They didn't worship in the right spot. They didn't do it right. They weren't real Jews. So who's the Samaritan? Well, Jesus himself. Jesus puts himself in the parable as the person that the Jews hate. And he didn't like that. But he's the one who has pity on the man. And every time I read it now, I think that line really makes a great deal of, of poignant sense to me. He sees me in my sinful state, and he has pity on me. Thank God for his pity. And he binds up the man's wounds, saves his life. And then he doesn't say, good, now you're going to be fine, see you around. He says, you need to get to the in. And I know you can't do it in your own strength. So I want you to get on my donkey. It says specifically, so he put the man on his own donkey and took him to the inn. Well, the inn was represented in the Middle Ages interpretation uh, as the church. The church is the place you go to heal up. The church is the place you go to be safe. So he takes him there. And I was telling the folks at dinner tonight, that when I first heard this story, I thought, well, that's, you know, an interesting interpretation. Uh, okay, maybe so. It's possible. Except for this. And when I heard this, I thought that's the only way it can be understood, or the, the main way. And that is, he says something that's inexplicable in any other interpretation I've ever heard. Do you know what the guy says at the end? He says, here's some money to the, the, the innkeeper. And then he says this. I'm going away, but I'm coming back. Do you see? And when I come back, I'll pay for everything he owes. It's the second coming. Now, I've always heard that interpreted as, who's your neighbor? And that's really what the guy asks, right? He says, he says uh, uh, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story, and at the end of it, he says to the, guy, to the guy who asked, so who was the neighbor? And the guy has to say, well, the Samaritan was obviously a good guy. He was good, the neighbor. Right, he says, that's correct. But that's not where the story starts in the scriptures. If you look back at, what is it, Luke 10, I think? Is it Luke 10? 10 or 11, one of the two. 10, I think. Anyway, it starts not with, who is my neighbor? A man came to Jesus and asked, who's my neighbor? That's not what it says. What it says is an expert in the law came to Jesus and asked him, wanted to trip him up, and said, what must I do to be saved? That's what he asked him. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, keep the law. What law? Well, love, love God, love your neighbor. Ah, I'm going to trip, trip him up now, see? He said, yeah, but who's my neighbor? You can't love everybody. Who's my neighbor? He tells the story. I have this little fantasy in my mind that that guy went home that night, went to bed, and woke bolt up and right up in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he said, <gasps> he answered my first question. Not just my second question, but my first one, you see? What must I do to be saved? 
Well, let me tell you about what you must do to be saved. You have to recognize that you left, you turned your back on the city of God and you've fallen into among robbers and you are completely unable to save yourself. And the law can't save you and the sacrificial system can't save you. Only the Samaritan, the one that you've been hating all this time, that's the guy. And not only does he do it, he does it without you lifting a finger. You don't get to do anything. He does it all for you. And he's going away, and when he comes back, he's going to pay for it all. Now, I told you that the, that the uh, church fathers, like Augustine, said, yeah, that's, that's the interpretation of that parable. Isn't that interesting? But I read Calvin, too, and I forget now where. It's in one of the commentaries where he talks about that. And he said, I don't like that interpretation. <laughs> but I read on to find out why. Well, he didn't have any problem with any of it except one thing, one bother. You know what it was? He said the guy didn't completely die. He wasn't brought back to life from dead, see. That, huh? Mostly dead. Mostly dead. I wanted to say, come on, John, it's a parable, you know? So there's a poetic way of interpreting the scripture that gives it life that is really marvelous if we can but see it. And one of the great ways you see, see, see the, the, the great, the, we study the arts because they give, us, they give us pictures of beauty, which is harmony. They give us pictures of metaphor so that we can see things that are invisible. And they become a repository of the wisdom of the past. I'm not saying it takes the place of scripture, don't get me wrong. This is human wisdom. So what I'm saying is I think art actually, in imitation of God, is a kind of general revelation. Not special revelation, can't save your soul. Beauty can't save your soul, I'm not saying it does. Special revelation is the only thing to save your soul. Jesus himself and the word that he speaks. But, but, we can speak the truth to one another. And when we do, we see anew new facets of that truth, and we're going to be doing that throughout all eternity. We're going to be singing new songs throughout eternity. We're going to be singing new, finding new ways to speak of the glory of God, just like this, this interpretation of that parable did, you see. If you give me th three more minutes, I'll, t I'll show you what I'm talking about in, in another nutshell. <clears throat> and then we'll call it a night. Um, let's say we wanted to write about the, the love of God to our children. And so we decided to make a fairy tale. So let's just make one up. Um, let's say there is a, a girl who is completely innocent. She's basically Eve before the fall. She's, she's wonderful. And because she's pure and innocent, we need to call her, you know, white, let's say, pure as, as clouds, let's say. So we'll call her Cloud White. How about that? And she is hated by this evil queen. And uh, the evil queen gives her a bit of fruit to eat that's poisoned. Uh, and she takes it innocently, eats it, falls asleep, and can't be woken up. So she's asleep and can't, nobody can help her. Now, how do we describe this nobody can help her part? Well, the entire world can't help her, just like Humpty Dumpty. He fell and all the king's horses and all the king's men, nothing could help him, you see. In the same way, poor Cloud White can't be helped by anybody. So <clears throat> what's, the, what's the number that we could use to symbolize uh, completeness? About seven. And what, what would be the, the way to symbolize their inability to do anything. Maybe we'll make them all short. Not that. Okay? So the name of the, the, name of the, the, the whole story could be Cloud White and the seven vertically challenged people. <laughs> well, of course, they can't do anything for her, but then what happens is a prince comes along. Now, who's a prince? A prince is the son of the king, right? And the prince comes along and shows his love to this cloud white girl. 
by having pity on her and showing his, specifically showing love by symbolically by kissing her. So he gives her the kiss of the handsome prince, whatever his name was. Prince nice guy. <laughs> and that wakes her up. You see? And then they marry and they go off to the kingdom and live happily ever after. Did you know that's what that story is about? It's very obvious now, isn't it? Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. It's not accidental that those elements are there. It's a way of telling the, the story, the story, the one story, of the love of the prince, the need of the girl. And you see, we all are the princess. We all are Snow White because we're the bride of Christ, right? It's not just about girls. It's about all mankind. She just represents us all because that's, how the, that's the state we're in, just like the guy in the parable was unable to save himself, you see. He represents all of us. Well, she represents all of us, and she's the bride of Christ, and he comes and saves her. Praise God. You all have been very patient. I hope you've heard my... My talk, seeing why it is it's so important to learn literatures, learn beauty in music, learn beauty in poetry, be able to con control words, be able to use them for their, for their good, to constantly reflect the beauty and the harmony and the metaphors that are necessary, the harmony of metaphors. And in the end, all do all to the Lord, glory of God. All of this work, this creative work to the glory of God, because these artworks are inherently worthwhile. They're not just worthwhile because they can make some money or because it's some gift I have, but because they actually exercise the gift that God has given us to be creative. And we're creative for some very purposeful reasons, to be able to speak the truth to one another in goodness and beauty. The, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is the, the concept of beauty to the students at, what is it, 8.30 or 9, something like that, tomorrow morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how that word beauty works and, uh, and why it's so important to speak the truth in beauty and not just the truth by itself. Okay? Thanks for your attention. God bless. Yep. Question?